and I always get challenged by you guys. It's always really good discussion. So, you know, don't hold back. There's a, a good team up the front here. I'm sure Marcel will have a couple of questions, but you know, also back me up as well uh, in a few areas. Um, so first up, I'm going to talk about the um, the orchard business analysis. So since 2008, we've been doing um, a survey of 24 businesses, um, Apple businesses across Australia, uh, and it's a property analysis of their business financials, right? It's not trying to get anything else but just a financial position and trying to look at the characteristics within the businesses um, as we see them. It's sort of, it's a way of creating some benchmarks or some uh, key indicators that might help you guys uh, evaluate your own businesses. It's also a really good document for the industry per se to actually model some changes that might be happening in terms of uh, at a political level, uh, a market um, entry level or something else. So we were talking with John Dollison the other day about since 2008, just the numbers as we go forward. And um, we sort of look at this and we felt pretty good in, the, in this period here, 2010 to 2012, you know, the, the climb was coming up and it was all really good. And then the last two years were, were plateaued and he's sort of saying, well, what's going on? Maybe we're not being that effective as an industry and we're, we're sort of um, just sitting here at this 40 ton mark and we've come up. Um, and it's pretty hard to explain that in terms of what we're doing, but... Uh, 2012 was a cooler summer with some summer rains. 2012, uh, very so that's that's the harvest of 2012, yes. nice year, okay, 2013, 2014 harvest, so we've got, you know, there's two seasons here, that's a forecast for 14, which has predominantly got the actuals in for 14 in terms of the crop, um, it just hasn't got, it's a forecast on the rest of the financials and the income level, but at production level that was predominantly an actual, but for two years we sat at that level as an industry. Um, the only real explanation I can sort of put in there is we're still investing, we've still got maybe a slightly higher proportion of younger trees uh, in here, and maybe that's part of the reason. This change in pack out's interesting, you might say, oh look, we're doing really well in here too, but there's actually 69% uh, down to 64%. It's not really a big shift in those numbers. The scale makes it look a lot more significant than it is. Put all those numbers in a table, but you multiply it through, and you look back in 2008, 36 tonnes, um, 25 tonnes marketable, dollar ninety a kilo, um, our revenue is 52, and with our current cost structure back then, we're making fourteen thousand dollars a hectare. Flip forward to 2013, oh, we're back four grand a hectare. Um, we've increased our tonnage, um, and here. Uh, pack out's roughly the same. We've listed out here, we've got a, a reasonable increase in our, um, our uh, per kilo revenue. So we've gone 52 to 59, but we've gone backwards with our cost structure coming up. So our cost structure's going up, we need to be doing better in this revenue game to be up there. The forecast for 14, yeah, better price again mainly, giving us a lift back to maybe the profit back in 2008. Any comments? Just look, just have a look at a variety snapshot. Um, so our average is just under that 40 ton mark and about a 70% pack out. But variety by variety through here, you know, Jazz is still only doing about 20 tons, still very young in its life cycle. Um, its uh, marketable yield is, or class one pack out is very high. We've got some good yield figures through here. And as an industry, we've still got to take into account peers as a reasonable percentage. So they're below the average. If we're 100% apple growers, then we might be just creeping over that 40 ton of average mark. <coughs> this is a business analysis, so we're looking at a whole business. And if I rank all 24 businesses, and I'm just looking at raw gala, and this is yield per hectare, so we've got up here at 70 tons for the business. So that business might have three or four blocks of gala but they're averaging 70 tonnes. And it's just a steady 
drop back into this mid range where Gale is sitting around this 35 tonnes, all the way back down to some blocks down here doing eight, eight or orchards doing eight tonnes. Um, so still a massive range in terms of yield figures. All these dots up in here sometimes is a discussion about as we increase our yield, as we push our limits, we fall off of quality, maybe colour, russet, something which is giving us a lower pack out. But generally the pack outs are relatively consistent across all those properties, just a little bit of variation, but you know we're still maintaining pretty reasonable pack outs at this, at this upper quartile level of yields. Similar graph on Pink Lady is a little bit more interesting. You've got this low level again down here. You're sort of saying it's, um, you know, it's 8 to 10 at a property level. You come up here and there's this plateau sort of between 30 and 40 tonnes on a property level. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, you've got this big jump into this area here where you're bringing 60 and, and uh, 70 tonnes. So there's a group of growers, a group of businesses in here, for whatever reason, they're breaking through the threshold and they're getting a really significant lift and then you go again and at a property level the start here this 90 tonne level. So, but still a very significant range in that result but some real steps in what's going on in terms of performances. And again the pack outs aren't changing across those yield levels. Is it relative to age of the blocks or is it mixed everywhere? So, it, so because it's a snapshot of, a, uh, of the business, you're going to have a mix of ages in there generally. You know, when you look at a grower like this, you want, oh, it's 100% mature. Well, there's not many businesses out there who are just 100% in the Pink Lady um, who say they'll still have some red strains or something else you know, coming on in that mix. They won't all be um, at full production. So you've still got a mix within that. So the range in revenue across the property. So in here, our average revenue points around 60, um, uh, 60,000 a hectare. But we're right up here at 110. And you might say, look at this group up in here, maybe sort of averaging just below the 100 mark as a group. The green line, the green is uh, the proportion of post-harvest costs. So therefore, the blue bar takes you back to the orchard gate return in terms of what they're achieving. And this proportion of, of um, uh, um, post-harvest cost, relatively consistent, except for one standout here, obviously he's got about 50% of his cost structure in post-harvest costs, and one down here where, or two down here, these low-yielding ones, very small proportion of post-harvest costs. So this one here's got you know, quite an issue really in terms of the proportion of their cost structure. Um, so, when you look at this data and we present it to the industry and at the back there's a model in there with this average built up the last four or five pages. You look at this average line sitting in here, it's actually a really, I was going to say dangerous way to describe it. It's a very simple way of describing you know, where the industry sits in terms of uh, performance. It's not grouped around here at all. You know, there's a very even spread and a lot of potential uh, and some significant businesses probably struggling within the mix as well. If we look at our costs over time in terms of uh, dollars per hectare, we can see down, you know, post harvest costs are definitely lifting up over time. We've got this, the labour bar per hectare is getting a little bit higher. We're probably holding our orchard working expenses, spraying, mowing, all those bits and pieces of fertiliser relatively stable within the mix, and our overheads are relatively stable within the mix. So the growth in our cost structures in this post harvest area. And, our, um, and the area in terms of uh, labour. Why is post harvest cost going up? Consistent. Labour. Sorry? Local. Labour. Labour in the post harvest sector. Cool. Cool. So, in an, an orchard, inside the orchard gate in, uh, in Australia, 35, 38 to 50% is labour of the cost structure. In the pack house, what percentage is labour? Cost of compliance is going through the roof. In the post harvest sector? In the post harvest sector, yeah, definitely. Transport. Uh, yeah. It's affected by energy. Mm. Um, everything's gone up. 
I think, Robert, in that, in that post, I said it was portion of wages to capital or interest you're paying, and technology is probably a little bit lower than on orchard. And I reckon it, it, we're spending a lot of money trying to extract value out of the crop. You know, we're trying to, we're spending money here to add value to the revenue line all the time to take an edge. And it might be compliance to get into a new market, it might be something around that. It's, yeah, it's packaging and, and that value added time. Yeah, yeah it's sort of like, and it's, and it's always about trying to get that revenue point up, and hopefully those decisions are, are, are positive and what we're trying to achieve. So that's on a per hectare basis. Um, when we come to a per kilo basis, this cost structure's you know, uh, a little flatter. Uh, the labour is staying on a per kilo basis almost the same because we've got that little lift happening in yield and this post, post harvest cost, which are all related to the kilo basis, um, still going up over time. But on a kilo basis, you know, which is our revenue point, really it's not going up as much. When we come down to that trading profit, I said before, if you look at our average point, you might say, oh, $8,000 a hectare, there's our average point. And you sort of think, and oh, yeah, okay, okay, so out of 24, we've probably got one, two, three, four that are the average out of 24. And then you've got, well, four up here that are, um, uh, what's that, 300%, 200% better. And you've got, you know, a cluster <coughs> here that are, you know, fourfold, worse off in terms of their profit line and that, and that lower quartile point. So a big range in this area. Every time we do this analysis, country, season, year, location, we're always getting the spread in, in, uh, in our Apple, um, Apple industry analysis. It's still the same. So there's a lot to be learned, and I'll go into it in a little bit more detail shortly, about um, where we uh, how we uh, can break that down. So, again, I said before, that average figure is a really sort of dangerous or awkward place to do. It's a good representative, it's a good way of modelling the industry, but it's also not telling us the whole story. So here, if we just try and cluster that up and we look at it in terms of the upper quartile, and we're looking on this, this profit graph again that I put up, and then we just take, look at this uh, top 25%, um, so we're looking at the six growers based on profit. So it's not every time I look at a characteristic, I'm saying, oh, they're the six, six based on yield or the six based on cost structure. So we've isolated now the six who are making the most uh, trading profit, and then we'll look at each of the characteristics as we go through. So when you look at this, the six top in terms of profit are, the, are in the top seven in terms of revenue per hectare. Except for this one, which we, which I pointed out before, because he's got a large cost structure post-harvest for some reason, which he has to sort out. So in those top seven, six of them are in the upper quartile on profit. So revenue is a really key driver. If you think about cost structure, out of those top six, they're spread almost evenly across the performance level in that, uh, across the 24. So, if this guy's got the highest revenue, oh sorry, if this guy's got the highest revenue and the lowest cost, he's going to be, you know, right up there in terms of profit line. But this level here, the cost structure is not where the focus is, or it's what the driver is in terms of net profit. It's all about the revenue state. Could be about variety mix and different things, and when you look at variety performance, you look at average returns per variety, and we, before we saw, um, uh, jazz at 20 tonnes to the hectare, but we're getting uh, 220, 225 on average return in here. And we look at uh, Fuji, Royal Gala, Pink Lady, this proportion of these fries all over $2 doing a really good number. Um, and down in here, Pears, WBC's not on here because it's processing, uh, so it's not a class one return. But what we're finding generally, you know, Pears are always down in this bottom bracket in terms of uh, returns and yield. The variety mix um, is also interesting. So the upper quartile, uh, significantly higher percentage in jazz, significantly higher percentage in standard pink lady, about the same in Royal Gala and Granny Smith, Fuji, so all of those are in that top quartile of price per kilo. 
Um, uh, but they're disproportionate in the red, uh, red pink lady and they're disproportionate in other. Now I, I found that one there really interesting. Why might that be? I thought, you know, top guy would be the one that's going, oh, that could be good for, I better put some of those in. Oh, that's a good, I'll go with Kenzie and I'll try some rocket and I'll, you know, and I'll do that and the upper quartile will have a higher percentage of other thinking about investing in something new all the time. But it wasn't the case. Any explanation? Is it golden grapes? Could be. But there's a lot of other new varieties in there as well, so it could be there. Could have been just the more, more responsible they're getting those new varieties, but they're kind of not going all out. Yeah, I just wonder, it's, it could be around risk management, you know. There's enough known about chairs now, and those guys have chosen to go for it, have gone for it, and it's a big jump in what they're doing. And then here you might have other new varieties in here, which they're biding their time, when they're proven they'll jump. You know, a lot of those top performers aren't always the absolute leaders in terms of variety choice of breaking new ground. They're actually the second movers. They're evaluating all the information, then they're jumping and uh, going into it in a slightly bigger way. So when we look at, um, so we talked about revenue, what drives, what, what makes up revenue? Production, pack out and price. So we look at this and we're thinking all the way through here in terms of yield. 35, 46, 50, 59, 20, 25, 47, 58, 36, 52, 48, 52. Always higher in terms of gross yield. Pack out, it's almost always up, but some are just similar. They're not massively up, but they're always probably trending on the slightly higher side on pack out. And price are uh, generally up a little bit, but not massively up. Uh, just occasionally you've got that. So key drivers on yield, pack outs up a little bit, and prices up a little bit. Now if I focus on three things in revenue, and I get a 10% increase in revenue, a 10% increase in pack out, and a 10% increase in uh, price, does that give me a 10% increase in uh, revenue overall? Gives me a 30% increase in revenue. Yes. 30, not 10. Yeah, 30%. Yeah. So I get a big jump. You know, in each one of these characteristics, you know, I can just lift this. So 10, 10, 10. We actually, you know, it makes a huge impact on our revenue if we can just focus on each little piece. You know, even if you just said 10 here, hold this, but a 5% increase there. It's cumulative uh, in terms of how we're going. And that upper quartile is seeing an edge in each one of those points. Again, that cost structure, relatively random through here, in terms of what's going on. But what you do see in terms of a per hectare basis in labour, the upper quartile is always spending more per hectare, but their per kilo figures are roughly the same. Overheads, oh, they're spending more, we're only a cent difference on a kilo basis. Um, post harvest costs, you know, they're spending more, but it's almost the same on a per kilo basis. We look at this over time, you know, on a um, per hectare basis, our harvesting's going up over time. This is, sorry, just averages. Um, this is going up over time. We're continually looking at um, our thinning costs going up over time. And the one trend line that's coming down is other wages over time, which I think is really interesting. That probably in the last, since 2008, people are looking a lot harder at that part of their business in terms of actually focusing on uh, real productivity of that other wages and making sure it's going into the other characteristics uh, that are really driving the profit. On a per kilo basis, you can see the harvest wages a little bit flatter, the southern wages is coming down, but the thinning's always coming up. Now, it's just an ongoing uh, characteristic I always see with top growers. They are always spending more time hand thinning. They never have the goal of, right, I'm gonna chemically thin this crop and I'm not gonna hand thin. They're always spending a good amount of money in pruning time um, to get the right 
uh, texture within their trees and the right quality. They're spending a lot of time, the chemical filling time, getting the sprayer set up, getting the distribution of what they're trying to achieve. When they come to hand thinning, it's a quality hand thinning. They're spending a lot of money to get the distribution within the tree right to get um, uh, a very high yield out of it. More often than not, when we get a you know like a, a chemical thinning result where we don't have to do any hand, hand thinning, we've got holes in the tree, and our yield's a little bit lower than we think, um, and it's just not delivering the size because the distribution within the tree's not right. So uh, again, the upper quartile are always just spending a little bit more on thinning um, and crop load management. We break labour down again, harvesting. Uh, it's logical they're spending more per hectare, but per kilo, very similar. Uh, pruning costs up a little bit, per kilo the same. Thinning, quite a bit more, and only an edge up on uh, their um, per kilo cost. Uh, other wages um, down a little bit, uh, levies management, other things. So when you multiply those things through, you know, the revenue, we've got a really significant difference here. You almost have a 50% increase in revenue over the average. Um, and when you bring it down here, you know, you've got a, uh, a threefold, twofold increase in terms of that bottom line number, which uh, creates, you know, a considerable amount of money to be able to invest in and manage other uh, risk factors and, uh, within the orchard. Okay. That's the end of that part of the presentation. Any comments on that? Questions about it? One of the earlier slides By variety? Uh, well, no, I was actually I think income by hectare, by what, some of those down 20,000 a hectare. Yeah. Um, is that, I suppose, is that encapsulating like a full plant replanting program or something? Is that, it wouldn't have been just too long if you had that role now over here. <laughs> no, it, that's right, but every time I've done this analysis, you know, in different industries, different locations, you're always getting spread, you're always finding people right at that low end. And you think, how can you survive? And you do, they're not surviving. They're just marking time, using up capital, and, and, and looking for another scenario. Occasionally, they're in this big redevelopment phase, and they're really going to kick on in a year's time or two years' time. But that's unusual. Usually, that lower cordial point is the lower cordial point, and it stays there. What would dream power? Per hectare, 50% more, and for $800, put it through the post harvest system. Sorry, go again. 50% more, um, oh sorry, that was revenue, revenue. as opposed to yield. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the yield down. factor is much less. Uh, I've got that yield figure back further. Uh, yeah, but the yield figure is, um, I think, 38 tonnes to. 45 was yeah. the upper quarter. I was never to 45 tons. So none, nonetheless, there's a difference there. And so, how do they do that? Because yeah. I can't. Yeah. So what? What is it? What? Are the, and this is this is uh, you got gross yield, and a lot of those other figures are on uh, class one pack here. But a lot of that upper quarter, you know, they've got simpler tree, you know, um, also in the post harvest sector. So that, you know, they might be having higher pack outs, the structure within their sheds are doing better. Um, some of the, in the report, some of these sheds are not always, they're not um, at a commercial level, they're within the business, you know. But in essence, uh, usually an upper quartile grower's got a high quality point, uh, whether it's size, whether it's um, uh, colour well, or something Generally else. you would think that, uh, Post harvest costs per hectare will be higher when you uh, in that other quartile because you have more fruit and yes. more of it is natural fact going into a box and to market. Yeah. It depends obviously how you're being charged. Yeah. 
and it's probably something you know like within this analysis there's a number of things that have come come out of if that's just if that we're seeing this increasing trend in post harvest costs over time maybe as an industry that's something we've got to drill into and look a little bit more at and say well how do we influence that how can we manage that better um, and work on it how do we influence that as a grower how do we form stronger partnerships with the sheds we're dealing with to make sure we, did, um, we can uh, benefit both parties. Uh, yeah. Can you put the slide up on varieties again? Um, yeah, for a question. Yeah. Uh, variety mix or yeah, the variety mix? More yeah. Like, yes. I didn't understand it, but you said the pink lady in red, is so that uh, rosy glow? Is that what yeah, so rosy glow, uh, lady in red, yeah. So the red strains of pink lady. This is just standard, you know, yes. Crips yes. pack. Yes. So this is the Australian average? Yeah, Australian, uh, sorry, yeah, the average. So this is the average there. So the average guy's got 5% in their mix. And the upper quartile, based on profit, have got um, only 2% in red strains. This looks to me not right. No, but, but maybe, you know, they've been putting their investment here, for example. So in the last three to five years, there's been a lot of investment in uh, jazz mm -hmm. rather than in this. Someone outside the jazz club, you know, outside the Montague's uh, influence, might have a, a lot different. Uh, no, that's true. That's what I'm not saying. But yeah. if you talk about Australian average, that's why I thought mm -hmm. it's not quite right. You yeah. see what I mean? And I work quite often now in Shepparton. Yeah. And uh, we are planting, especially last couple of years, yeah, yeah. Rosie Glow, Rosie Glow, that's the only thing we plant. And I would expect much higher rates, and even grafting. So many crops are grafted all from big lady too. Yeah. That's why I'm crashing the data yeah. for this. Um, if that's the case, nobody has to worry about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, we're seeing things changing for sure. Yeah. This is a snapshot of 24 growers. You know, all around the country. It's, the, it's around the country. It's the best information we have at the moment. Uh, APEL's in the middle uh, of a data project trying to capture tree strats and get a lot better handle on the variety mix and hectares and where this yield uh, scenario might unfold. So uh, that's something really positive that'll actually help us, you know, if this is actually 10 or 15 percent and we're only representing it as uh, five, then yeah, there is a real issue here in terms of where that production's heading over time, um, for sure. Another problem I see with uh, club varieties like jazz. Um, on the positive side, is people who are in it, is not in it. But the people who are not in it, they, you know what I mean. The yeah. jazz is closed, <coughs> and that's really an issue for growers who are not in it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and everyone's got to make those choices around genetics uh, as best they can for their situation and, and work out what they can do. Yeah. 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 But district yeah. average here is certainly different from that. Yeah, everyone says that, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of yield? I know the figures that I've worked with around here are different to that. Mm, that's total auction. Mm -hmm. So you're saying in terms of the yield factor for here, we were looking at... Um, we was it right back at the start? So. Here. So if we're sitting at a gross yield of uh, 40 tonnes and a packed yield of 26 tonnes. There's certainly variation on that in this district, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, no massive variation. And it's always interesting, I ask this question to people, you know, what yield are you doing per hectare? If you ask them that question, you'll get a number, 46, 47, I remember the wind. So I never ask that question. I always ask, oh, how many hectares are you spraying? Oh, 48. Cool, 48, right there, one there. How many bins did you submit to the cool store this year? Oh, cool. What way do you bins? Oh, okay, so that's uh, 33 tonnes to the hectare. You know, and they don't think about, and this is overall, so this is young trees as well, you know, uh, non producing. So when you compare that number, that compares to an Italian number of uh, 62 and a New Zealand number of 57, um, Chile. And, 38 or 39 tons to the hectare and what and USA, I don't know what Washington State's probably gone well over 40 tons this year. It's a crazy number, but they've been planting a lot of hectares. 
So it's a, it's a whole industry basis, you know, property basis number. All hectares is planted at all ages. Yeah. So you know, you think about it. The benchmarks out of that to me are saying 100 tons. You know, you're just marking. Uh, sorry, 100 bins to the hectare. You're marking time. You've got to be sort of pushing everything towards 150 bins to the hectare. And you know, really good results. You know, when you're really pleased with yourself, you've got to be. You know, have a few, few blocks of doing 200 bins to the hectare, and that, and that's where we should be aiming at. That 200 bins to the to the hectare number. And uh, this is sitting well back with just 100. Well, we did the number the other day in the paddock with uh, growers in, uh, uh, in Devonport. You know, one guy came out at 92 bins and he sort of said, you know, and that was way different than what he actually originally told me. And then the neighbour neighbor came out and, we, and he was standing and we just asked him exactly the same questions. And he was 35% more. And the other growers, really? How are you doing that? You know, like he had no idea that the neighbour was doing 35% better than he was. All right, you've got a very full report. There's all the details in there. There's a discussion at the back of it. There's a whole lot of financial models and numbers which you can use as your own benchmark or a little bit of a guideline. If there's any other questions during today, fire them back up to me when we're out in the field or uh, tonight over the barbecue. More than happy to, to go through any other details or um, about it. But, uh,